We survived a tornado. It destroyed the house around us. I was always told, you go through a disaster that big, you'll never be the person you were before then. I'm my dad's only child. He had a hard life, but me and my dad was close. We go fishing, drink, play cards. He always set my poles because I don't have the patience to do all the lines. And he was always my girl at the cookouts. Even the day of the tornado, there was 50 of us at the house, a big Memorial Day cookout. He cooked and we had a blast. 60 days later, August 4th, I was starting to get back ahead in life. I quit working all the time, started making time for my family. It was my sister's husband's birthday. My girlfriend, Dania, and I picked up my dad, and we all went out to the Oregon district. When we get there, he was asleep in the car. But he said, if you're going in, I'm going in. He was buying all our drinks, dancing. When we get outside, me and my dad and Danita were waiting for my sister and her husband. I saw the shooter coming down the side of the building with the gun and the black mask. I'm thinking, this ain't real. Because why would you do that? There's all the police around. But he walks in between the cars, brings his guns up, and shoots a couple of times. My dad hits the ground, but I don't see any blood. No one panicked yet, so I'm still thinking this ain't real. Once he got on the other side of the street, you start to hear the barrage of gunshots. I'm like, Dad, get up. We got to get out of here. I grab out my phone. I start calling 911. I say, come on. Dad, get up. He's just looking at me. I want to say something to me. I got down by his head and I start seeing the blood. I just grab onto him and start telling him, I love you. I'm thinking, at least you'll hear my words telling you I'm here. The police come, but I don't want anyone touching me. Once I see them put the sheets over my dad, I just lose it. I'm angry, I'm slapping. I start being windows and brick walls, yelling. I didn't care about nothing but what was in front of me. We were stepping over bodies with white sheets and blood, just bodies, bodies. It was like a scary scene out of a movie. It just didn't seem real. Even now I'm still in shock. What wonderful advice was never passed on? What milestones were never celebrated? An urgent voice broke over the Dayton police radio. Gunshots fired, multiple people shot. It was as if an electric shock coursed through my body. I didn't hang around to listen to anything else. I ran to my cruiser, fired up the engine, realizing that every precious second was exactly that. A precious second. I hit the lights, the siren, and the gas, but what order, I don't remember. I parked. Throngs of Oregon District patrons were running toward me in a panic. Waves of wide-eyed humans passing me. As I threaded my way through a sea of confusion and mayhem, I quickly saw where I was needed. A gentleman was lying in the street screaming in pain. I quickly checked his front side and saw no blood, so I rolled him over. Again, I found no wound, so I left him there screaming. Later, I found out he had fallen and broken his pelvis. The next patient I attended was a young lady who had been shot through the arm and was bleeding profusely. A bystander was performing CPR. I dropped to my knees. I placed my finger over the brachial artery, trying to stem the intense bleeding. A Dayton police officer arrived at the same time and put a tourniquet on her arm. The bullet had passed through her upper extremity and lodged in her chest. Once the tourniquet was in place, I checked for a carotid pulse. It was absent. 
I took over CPR for the exhausted bystander. But all of our efforts were for naught. Later, I draped a white sheet over the victim. It turned out that was the shooter's sister. What paintings didn't get painted? What stories were never told? What wonderful advice was never passed on? What milestones were never celebrated? We will never know. I ran the door at Ned Pepper's for a long time. I heard four shots come from across the street. I've lived in the city long enough to be able to kind of pinpoint where shots are coming from. I just expected to see some guys running away because it went pow, 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 real quick. And I thought it was just some inner city beef and people were gonna scatter and it'd be over. There was a brief lull after those first four shots and then it started again. It was intentional. It was targeted. I realized it wasn't just a handgun. It was a much more powerful gun. I started looking for muzzle flash. But as I started looking, all hell was breaking loose and people were running past me. I realized at that point I needed to kind of protect myself. I realized that I could not do anything to neutralize whoever was shooting because I couldn't locate them. The shots were going off. They kept going off. One of the other bouncers said, get inside, get inside. I wear a vest when I'm out of my bike. As I run in, my vest catches the door handle and it jerks me to a stop and I have to back up, bullets going past. I have to unhook myself. I look directly ahead of me. It's just a pile of human beings. The whole dance floor, about two thirds of the way back, was a wall of people trying to climb over each other. I look to the right, to where you go up to the DJ booth or go downstairs. People had crowded in there, blocking the stairs, both directions, up and down. I look to the bar. There's no way I can actually get down behind the bar. Gunshots are going off. There's nowhere to go. I got down behind the trash can and put my back up against it. The only thing blocking me was a Rubbermaid trash can. I just made myself as small as possible. I remember thinking, pull your legs in, get small, get small. So I got small and I remember covering my head like in a tornado drill in school and I would open my eyes every once in a while. There was a car, headlights shining in and maybe it was a street light, I don't know. It was a bright light shining into that patio wall that was open. And I remember dust, dust just rolling past me, illuminated by the light. Whether it was gun smoke or what, I just remember all this dust going past me. The only thing I can think of was my eldest daughter just turned 11. She's going to remember me. My middle daughter had just turned three she may have some vague memories of me, but my youngest was a year and a half, and there's no way that she is gonna remember me. And I kept thinking, there's no way that Haley is gonna remember her dad. I was close enough that I could hear the bullets crack as they went by. It was like a miniature sonic boom, a sound that I never want to hear again. Then all of a sudden, the shooting was done. I don't know how I figured out it was certainly over and safe to stand up, but you can see on one of the videos that they played on the news, me standing up next to the trash can. I kept checking myself, feeling myself. Where are the bullets? Where are the bullet holes? I stood up and there was that guy, Connor Betts, dead, basically four feet away from me. I watched his body start to change color. Very quickly, when a human being dies, the color leaves their body. I sat there looking at this guy and his chubby face was 
kind of pointed up at me. I didn't see some animal, some monster. I saw somebody's child. Somebody's kid just got killed. He was somebody's pride and joy. I guess I was totally in shock. I shut down. Down the sidewalk, people were laid out. Some had been shot, some hadn't. Some were alive, some were dead. So fuzzy, so clear, all at the same time. The killer, whose name is now known but not worth listing here, had been silenced by the bullets of the brave Dayton officers who were patrolling the street that night. The first several victims were driven to the hospital in police cruisers. Then, with the scene safe, the medics began to arrive. With no one else needing CPR or tourniquets, I turned my focus to the crowd which was starting to head back toward this crime scene. I knew my next duty was crowd control. So I pushed the throngs back, separating the frightened witnesses from the frightened non-witnesses. And as I stood there, arms outstretched, something drew my senses to the left, down a short walkway. The air was full of the smell of burning meat coming from a food cart that had been abandoned in the chaos. And as I looked to my left, I saw the outline of something on the ground. I drew closer. It was a black man on black asphalt in the black of night, only slightly illuminated by the patio lights of blind bobs. He must have been one of the first victims to be gunned down. I checked him for signs of life, a pulse, when I saw the terrific wound, I realized nothing could be done. I put a sheet over him, as I had with the shooter's sister. I got diagnosed with acute PTSD. My therapist told me, just right. And that's where the good came, forgiving God. For a moment, I thought he was coming after me, forgiving the shooter. I wrote to his parents and told them, if you need to talk, I'll listen. I forgive you because they lost both their kids. I started to fight to represent my father and all the rest of the victims whose lives were taken to keep their names alive here and across the nation. My dad used to ring the bell for the Salvation Army and last year, I stood in place for him. I started a nonprofit in his name. I started to speak, going to conferences for 9-11, Orlando, Las Vegas, Chicago, trying to turn something negative into something positive. I want all those places to have a survivor's walk. If tacos can get a taco day, why can't we have a day to keep memories alive, bring in survivors from all avenues of life, let them share their stories together. People hold so much in, they don't know how to talk about it. But if you talk to someone who's going through the same thing, this is all God's work. With the tornado, the shooting, COVID, we all get to reconnect and get back to the focus point of life. That's family, that's friends, that's the community. We're realizing we're stronger together than we are apart. This is something I'm going to live with with the rest of my life. I'm tired of fighting. But if I can change something, not the world, but somebody, maybe it'll be worth it someday. It all comes out in the news several days later. They had so many red flags that this kid was disturbed. The kid had a hit list. The kid had this, 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 this. People knew this kid was dangerous. They never got him the mental health help that he needed. 
the whole system failed this kid. On the morning of August 4th, I'm sitting on the couch with my wife and my two youngest daughters, and I'm crying, and I finally kind of dry up a little bit. I look over, and my one-and-a-half-year-old has a balloon, and it pops up out of her hands and into the air. She's reaching in the air for it and giggling and smiling so big. She's so happy with a simplistic thing like a balloon. So pure. I lost it. I broke down harder than I've ever broken down in my life. I told my wife, you know, his parents used to watch him do that. Connor Betts' parents used to watch him do that. I got home 90 minutes late. My wife greeted me. I asked if she'd seen the morning news. She had not, so I told her of the terrible slaughter and my efforts to help. With deep eyes, she looked at me and said, oh, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. But then her countenance changed. You know, I'm actually glad it was you. <laughs> that was the kindest thing that anyone could have said to me. Well, in the days and weeks that followed, my thoughts would drift back to the wee hours of August 4th. I was glad I was there. I was sleeping well enough, the expected nightmares never visited me. However, one day I was waiting for my cheese steak to finish cooking on a grill, and suddenly I was back on Fifth Street. Sirens flashing, chaos revolving all around me. What the? I, I said to myself. But then it dawned on me. It was the smell of the meat burning on the abandoned food cart. The aroma of my sizzling sandwich had taken me back to that night. Julian Barnes, the great English novelist, asked, Do the books that writers don't write even matter? And what about the unfinished accomplishments of the nine gentle spirits felled by a madman's bullets? What paintings didn't get painted? What stories were never told? What Wonderful advice was never passed on. What milestones were never celebrated? We'll never know. It is deeply saddening. And this sadness brings me to the question, in America, should weapons of war be in the hands of civilians? We're realizing we're stronger together than we are apart. I didn't see some animal, some monster. I saw somebody's child. What paintings didn't get painted? What stories were never told? What wonderful advice was never passed on? What milestones were never celebrated? We will never know.